بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله to everyone joining us today continuing on with our weekly sessions on علوم القرآن so last week, I mean the week before, the first lesson we did was, it was actually supposed to be session two, the topic, but I wanted to get into the topic of uh, the actual subjects. And this session today is the introductory topic, uh, which we were supposed to have on the first week, um, informing us regarding the topic of Ulum al-Quran, and key scholars and in particular let's trying to figure this out okay um one moment it's not working for some reason bismillah Apologies, let me try and fix this. Share, let's try this one. Okay, Bismillah. Bismillah. Not working. Oh, there we go, Alhamdulillah. Right, so the subject of Ulum al-Quran, and also we want to talk a bit about the book. This is the book. This is one of the versions of the book. Right, uh, an approach to the Quranic sciences, Ulum al Quran, actually written in Urdu and it was translated into English. And we'll speak more about the book in a little while. But first of all, I want to talk about the topic of Ulum al Quran. Ulum means sciences, subjects, and Quran obviously is the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So all of the sciences connected to the Quran. Apologies. Purpose of study. Why are we studying? Again, we briefly mentioned this two weeks ago. Why are we studying this? So we're studying this because number one, we want to know what Allah is saying to us, to better understand the Qur'an, right? It is the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is our first and foremost primary source. And so it's only appropriate that we should know what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying to us. I remember before I ever started on the journey of seeking ilm, a teacher once asked me, uh, so the teacher was holding a separate lesson for a couple of students, which was a lesson on the translation of the Qur'an. And so he finished the lesson and then he turned to me and he said to me, Shu'aib, have you ever thought to yourself what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying to you? And I thought about it and I was, I was like, yeah, of course, all the time. Sometimes I sit in the khutbah and I'm wondering, the khutbah is a, is, a, is a talk, is a lecture, is an address. And I'm wondering what the imam is saying. And sometimes we're praying salah. Right now, subhanAllah, you know, uh, we're in Ramadan. And so many of us have the opportunity of praying taraweeh. And subhanAllah, what's the, what's the imam saying? So many fascinating stories and anecdotes and advice and warnings. But we have no idea what they're saying, what it's saying to us. So I told my teacher, of course, and then he said, why don't you enroll in a class um, that teaches Arabic and the subjects of the Qur'an, Ulum al-Qur'an. And subhanAllah, ever since then, I, I, I haven't looked back, alhamdulillah. So number one, why do we, why do we study Ulum al-Qur'an? to get a better understanding of the Qur'an and to understand what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying to us. The second reason is to build a lasting relationship with the Qur'an. Again, since it's our primary source and it is our foundation, the foundation of our deen, 
it's incumbent upon us to try and build a lasting relationship with the Qur'an. The third reason why we study Ulum al-Qur'an is to invest in the Qur'an, right? As we mentioned a couple of weeks ago, we invest in the things that we care about, uh, the, the people that we care about, celebrities, sports teams, uh, books, etc. And so the Qur'an, subhanAllah, this is one way in which we can invest in the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And finally, last but not least, but also there are many other, arguably many other reasons for studying Ulum al-Quran. Finally, is to strengthen belief, strengthen and defend your iman, right? Unfortunately, and this is one of the things that we're going to talk about in this course, unfortunately, there have been people who will always try to undermine the Qur'an and, and object to the Qur'an. And if we don't have the necessary tools and information at hand, then we will not be able to defend our deen. Uh, SubhanAllah, the deen doesn't need defending, but SubhanAllah, for our own benefit and the people and other Muslims, uh, if you've got a constant barrage of objections, SubhanAllah, it's only right that we have uh, content there that can counter that, right? So being able to answer the objections and strengthen and, and defend our Iman and also to realize the miraculous nature of the Qur'an, which is one of the topics that we're going to be discussing, inshallah. So this is why we are studying this topic, Ulum al-Qur'an. Before going into any subject, before studying any subject, there's a couple of key points you need to be aware of, right? And this is information that is integral to the topic. The first point that we need to be aware of is the literature review of that subject, right? Literature review is basically a list of the earliest, from the earliest literature written on that subject up to now, and who are the main, what are the main books, and who are the main scholars, and who are the main names that you're going to see again and again. So it's best we begin by discussing uh, the literature review of Ulum al-Qur'an. So there's actually, it's gone through many stages. So, but if we consider the first stage of Ulum al-Quran, it was when you had scholars who would write literature, but it was on, it was focused on specific topics. So as in the Ulum al-Quran books we have today, uh, for example, this one here by Mufti Taqi Uthmani, this book here says Quranic sciences, and you open this book, you're going to see all of the sciences, uh, one after the other, listed and explained. But the earliest books were topic-specific books, right? So they would have one genre, and they would basically just write on that genre. So the earliest was, that was the system. Uh, some of the earliest books were, for example, Abu Ubaid Qasim ibn Salam's book on abrogation. Abrogation, Nasikh and Nasr, right, is a topic that we're going to discuss, inshallah. Nasr in the Quran, certain verses have been abrogated by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Sometimes the verses, the recitation is abrogated. Sometimes only the meaning is abrogated. Sometimes both are abrogated, right? So we'll discuss that, inshallah. But some of these were some of the topics that were written initially specific books on the topic of abrogation also you had imam farra farra was earlier and he had a book called maani al quran meanings of the quran another scholar ibn qutayba uh, this book is his book is called mushkil al quran some scholars wrote books on certain words in the Qur'an or certain verses that might prove um, not so straightforward. And so he wrote a book explaining those concepts, Mushkil al-Qur'an. Imam Tahawi, the famous uh, 
the famous jurist, scholar, muhaddith, he wrote Ahkam al-Qur'an, which, which centered around the jurisprudence of the Qur'an. And subhanAllah, many scholars ever since that have written books called Ahkam al-Qur'an, right? You've got a number of different um, scholars who have uh, Ibn al-Arabi, for example, Imam Suyuti, uh, many of the scholars who have books actually called Ahkam al-Qur'an. Also, you had Imam Nahas, a, the grammarian. He had a book called I'rab al-Qur'an. This book centered around the grammatical analysis of the verses of the Qur'an, right? And so you had, uh, the whole book was basically about that. It wasn't explained through hadith or, you know, asbab al-nuzul. It was basically I'rab al-Qur'an. It was basically gr grammar. Imam Baqillani had a book called I'jaz al-Qur'an. This book focused around the miraculous nature of the Qur'an. What makes the Qur'an so miraculous? It's not just one thing, subhanAllah. There are a number of layers, every single one, of every single one of them, miracle after miracle. So this was Imam Baqillani's book. You had Imam Wahidi, who has a famous book on Asbab al-Nuzul. is another topic we're going to discuss, inshallah. Asbab al-Nuzul means the, the causes. You could say cause of revelation or not necessarily cause, but it was what instigated the revelation, right? An incident would take place and then a verse would be revealed. And so Imam Wahidi collected all of the ahadith he could find on Asbab al-Nuzul, verses of the Qur'an that have sabbaths. <clears throat> and again, this is, not, this is not an exhaustive list. SubhanAllah, there are hundreds more, but I'm just pointing out the probably the most famous ones and ones names that you're going to come across, inshallah. Imam Raghib Isfahani's or Isfahani's book, Mufradat fi Gharib al-Qur'an. Again, another amazing book. This one focuses on the, it's basically a dictionary. It's like a dictionary and uh, words that need further explanation in the Quran. He has an amazing discussion of all of those words, their variations, the different types of meanings that they can hold and so on and so forth. The next stage was collated topics. So as we said, the first stage, all of those books that we've just mentioned, they were books centered on a specific topic of a science of the Quran. After some time, what scholars began to do was they began to collate these topics and they began to collect the information and present them all in one place. So the earliest, uh, versions of that are a scholar named Muhammad ibn Khalaf al-Marzuban in the 4th century after Hijri. He had a book regarding Ulum al-Qur'an where he collated many of the different topics. Also Abu Bakr al-Anbari uh, from the 4th century also, he did something similar. Again, later on it, become, it became very popular to do that but in the beginning that wasn't the case how about the most famous now those two names that i mentioned to you if you're a serious student of the quran and the dean you might come across those names but there are other names pioneers who have basically released a book in the topic in the field and have basically taken over the um most of the discussions and, and, and anyone who has anything to say about the Quran will always refer back to some of these scholars. First and foremost, Ibn Taymiyyah, rahimahullah, has a book called Muqaddima fi Usul al-Tafsir, followed by Al-Burhan by Imam Zarkashi. This is another book that you will find Quoted exhaustively. Another book 
this is probably one you've probably heard about uh, very often al itqan fi ulum al quran by imam al suyuti jalaluddin al suyuti Torah publishing actually have a mukhtasar an abridged version of this right now al itqan is very big very thick and it's not you're not going to be able to get through it in a week or two right and it takes time and effort uh, in arabic and even if there was i'm not sure if there's an arabic in, uh, english translation of the full thing but torah have uh, released a a an abridgement of al-itqal and it's called gateway to the quranic site excuse me gateway to the quranic sciences a summary right uh, check that out inshallah brilliant book again it will basically point out to you some of the main topics that you're going to find in ulum al-quran and probably give you a couple of points here or there but nothing too deep if you want to go further then inshallah you can see and refer to the whole collection inshallah Tafsir at Tasheel Ulum al Tanzil by Ibn Juzay Rahimahullah. Now, some of you, Ibn Juzay al Kalbi Rahimahullah, some of you are probably wondering if you know this book, even if you don't, just by the first word, uh, you might have a question, and that is this is not exactly a, a book on Ulum al Quran, it's a tafsir, right? Well, you'd be correct uh, in thinking that. But if any of you have re read the introduction, you will find it's absolutely amazing, subhanAllah, right? At Tasheel li Ulum al Tanzil is a tafsir book, but in the beginning, he has a brief but extremely comprehensive introduction. When I teach Ulum al Quran to the students, there's a couple of books that I use primarily Mufti Taqi Uthmani's Ulum al Quran. But along with that, the other main book that I usually use is Ibn Juzay's Tasheel li Ulum al Tanzil. And the introduction is, subhanAllah, so basic, so simple, so brief that it manages to encapsulate a lot of what you will mainly discuss in Ulum al-Qur'an. So although this is a tafsir, the introduction is quite amazing, mashallah, and I would recommend, I would recommend everyone to um, have a look at that, inshallah. Al-Fawz al-Kabir, Shawali Allah Dahlawi, is very, very, very brief. Uh, however, and it covers some uh, discussions, but those discussions, it goes into extreme detail. Um, so I would recommend Al-Fawz Al-Kabir for uh, in-depth discussions on certain subjects uh, of the Qur'an as opposed to others. But yeah, definitely a, definitely a read, inshallah, Al-Fawz Al-Kabir. So now we, those are classical books, right? We had from the time of the Salaf and from the time of the Khalaf, and now we have a look at some contemporary books. We'll look at some contemporary books in in, in, uh, in Arabic, sorry, and then also in English. So first of all is Manahil al-Irfan by Imam Zurqani, uh, famous book of Ulum al-Quran. And also a book that I like to use quite often is Mabahith fi Ulum al-Quran by a scholar named Manna' al-Qattan, rahimahullah. Again, very, I wouldn't say it's so brief, uh, but it's very comprehensive, mashallah, and it manages to capture quite a lot of the main subjects in Ulum al Quran. English books, for those of you who do not speak Arabic or you can't read Arabic, now's the time to start, um, inshallah. But again, until you can, until you feel confident, then there are these books that you can refer to. Or rather, I will give you the names of the authors and inshallah, um, you can, because usually they're called Ulum al-Quran or Sciences of the Quran or some sort of variation of that sort. So you have a book by Yasir Qadi, Abu Ammar Yasir Qadi, the famous Yasir Qadi that many of you are aware of from the internet. And the second one, Abu Amina Bilal Phillips. After that, we have Ahmed von Denfer, which is brilliant. 
his book really does engage with a lot of Orientalist methodologies. So that's definitely a read, a must read. And finally, now we have a book in English by Mufti Muhammad Taqi Uthmani, Hafidahullah. May Allah safeguard him and may Allah give us the ability to continue benefiting from his knowledge, inshallah. So this is the book, right? This is actually, this is a sneak peek, by the way, of the cover. Hold on a second. Um, I need to move this. Yeah. This is a sneak peek of, uh, subhanAllah, apologies. Sorry about that. I need to just take a screenshot of this. Yeah. This is a sneak peek of the front cover of the new, the new publication. So this, uh, someone put a PDF up last week, right? And that was uh, that was that was one version. This is another version. Now, this old one was written a very long time ago, as in the translation was done a very long time ago. It was translated by Dr. Muhammad Saleh Siddiqui, right? And this translation was done, or this version was published in two thousand. So uh, quite a long time ago, and and so what we realized was the the language is quite outdated, and it was in desperate need of revision and a better translation. So Alhamdulillah, some scholars came together uh, at Turath Publishing, and they started this journey in trying to in trying to present this book in a professional way in uh, smooth flowing english inshallah ta'ala um yeah to a new audience a you know a new generation inshallah so we pray allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accepts this endeavor we pray allah subhanahu wa ta'ala continues to benefit the ummah through it inshallah and we pray that you all buy a copy inshallah so that's approaching the Quranic sciences, which is basically what this lesson or this uh, course is going to be primarily based on, but not totally. So the book, what is the basic uh, methodology of the book? Why was it written? What are the key features in the book? We'll have a look at those things. First of all, if you read the introduction, you will notice or you will find out that Mufti Taqi Uthmani's original in purpose behind this was to write an introduction to his father Mufti Shafi' Rahimahullah's book Ma'arif al-Qur'an and subhanAllah it became so long and detailed and it basically was enough to constitute a separate book altogether One of the main reasons for or motivations for writing this book was to address Western Orientalist objections to the Quran. We're going to have a whole a whole session, inshallah, on Orientalism. In brief, Orientalism is the study of Islam by non-Muslims, and hence what you will find is the non-stop criticism and nitpicking. <clears throat> of the deen, uh, verses of the Qur'an and a hadith. And so very few people are equipped with the ability to engage with academics at that level, right? Because subhanAllah, those academics, well, most of them, they seem to have done their research. And so they have sometimes genuine objections, mostly unfair objections but we can we can see those inshallah as we as we go along and so Mufti Taqi Uthmani again as we mentioned before Ahmed von Denfer does the same thing uh, Manna al-Qattan again they're usually they're usually contemporary books that uh, engage with orientalism and so one of the main focuses of Ulum al-Quran is the uh, engaging with and critiquing Orientalism and their opinions on Islam. 
Another focus of the book, Approaching the Quranic Sciences, is the importance that is given to the Quran and Sunnah. Again, we need to understand and be clear that these two are our the basis of our deen, and we cannot let them go, right? Many people nowadays will take the Quran and leave the Sunnah. Others will, subhanAllah, try to get rid of both, na'udhu billah, and still claim to be a Muslim, um, you know, unfortunately. But, subhanAllah, Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah, we take the Qur'an and we take the Sunnah and we take it very, very seriously. In addition to that, however, Mufti Taqi Uthmani does make use of logic and rationale to establish certain points. For example, the belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the need for revelation and abrogation. So he will present the proofs from the Quran and Sunnah, and then he will present the logical proofs, right? Now, one thing we need to understand, and we will probably reiterate this again and again, and it's something that Mufti Taqi Uthmani reiterates again and again, and that is that our basis is not logic and rational. Our basis is the Quran and Sunnah, right? Our basis is the Quran and Sunnah, and we use logic and rational as a tool to maybe try and explain to people who are weak in their Iman, right? So we don't base our deen, number one, or first and foremost on logic and rationale, and then we see what the Quran and Sunnah says. No, we don't do that. We see what the Quran and Sunnah say, and then we use logic and rationale to try and uh, understand those points. One thing you'll find about Ulum al-Quran is it's, it's a tad repetitive sometimes, but not without reason. Right, The repetition that you'll find in this book actually highlights the important messages that need reiterating. So you'll find again and again Mufti Taqi Uthmani stressing something about the Qur'an and the Sunnah or stressing something about the need for uh, revelation. And there's always a reason for that, subhanAllah. So that's the methodology of the book of approaching the Quranic sciences. Let's have a look at a brief outline and in brief touch upon some of the topics that we will find therein. So section one, there's actually two sections, right? The book is split into two sections. The first section is about two thirds of the book and the second section is the last third. The first section is regarding the sciences linked to the Quran, right? And the second is the discussions linked to tafsir. So two thirds of the book, topics linked to the Quran, and the, the last third is discussions linked to tafsir. Let's have a look at each of these. Bismillah, first of all, revelation. So the science is linked to the Quran. The first topic that Mufti Taqi Uthmani discusses is the topic of revelation, right? the types of revelation, the methods of revelation, the need for revelation, how did the revelation come down, right? So that's number one. Number two, history uh, and preservation of the Qur'an, which we will discuss, inshallah. Further, he discusses Makkan and Medinan verses. I think we touched upon this very briefly in the first week. So inshallah, we'll also... Mufti Taqi discusses that. We'll also look at it, inshallah. Asbab al Nuzul. Uh, we spoke about this already briefly. Uh, Ahruf of the Quran. Now, Ahruf of the Quran is a very, very, very lengthy discussion. We're not going to go too much into it unless uh, it's, uh, it's by demand and request, then we possibly can. I don't want to get into anything that's going to confuse people, right? So the Ahruf of the Qur'an, it's based on a hadith uh, wherein the Prophet wasallam said that the Qur'an was revealed upon seven Ahruf. Now the Ahruf, there is massive difference of opinion regarding what the Ahruf refer to. 
And so getting into that, it's it's quite a lengthy discussion. Inshallah, we can go through it if need be. Abrogation, the verses that are abrogated and those that were abrogated, those that were the, that they were abrogated by, excuse me, preservation of the Quran, readings of the Quran, the Qira'at, the famous seven, ten readings, we will go through that too. Orientalism, as we just discussed, truthfulness of the Quran, what makes the Quran true? This is another topic that Mufti Taqi Uthmani discusses, miraculous nature of the Quran, whether that's from past incidents, quoting past incidents, incidences, making future prophecies, uh, the language miracle, uh, scientific miracles, a number of different things could be argued to be miracles of the Quran. We'll discuss those in their places, inshallah, and topics discussed in the Quran, subjects discussed in the Quran. And the second section is, as we said, discussions linked to tafsir. This will discuss, number one, sources of tafsir, reliable and unreliable. And in addition to that is the topic of Israeliyat. We'll have a whole session on this, inshallah, Israeliyat, something that's very important. Israeliyat are basically narrations that have found their way into Islam and literature of tafsir but they have their source is from christian and jewish sources basically so inshallah we'll discuss that can we take those things uh, what can we take what can we take can we trust them and so on and so forth also principles of deriving tafsir what is needed for deriving tafsir Many people, unfortunately, think it's quite easy to do tafsir and they think it all it takes is five minutes of pondering over a verse, over a verse, and, um, and they think, yeah, subhanAllah, that's good. You know, I think, I think, subhanAllah, it means this. Allah save us. Um, so, yeah, there are principles needed for deriving tafsir. Also, interpretation. Ta'wil, the topic of ta'wil. What's the difference of tafsir and ta'wil, if any? The different scholars have different opinions as to what the relationship of tafsir is to ta'wil. Also discussed in the book, <coughs> excuse me, exegetes throughout the generations. Exegetes is the word usually used for mufassir or a commentator. So the famous exegetes that we know about through the generations, Imam al-Tabari, Ibn Kathir, Qurtubi, Imam al-Lusi, uh, Abis Saud, right? All of these famous exegetes, and he even takes it up to the contemporary era. And fin f finally, the famous tafsir books. So, this is, in a nutshell, what the topic of Ulum al Quran entails, and what we will, inshallah ta'ala, some of what we will be studying over the course of the next eight to nine weeks, inshallah ta'ala. Inshallah, we will end this session with the dua, Allahumma arhamna bil Qur'an. O oh Allah, grant us mercy through the Qur'an, waj'alhu lana imama wa nura, and make it a, 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 a leader for us and a source of light, wa huda wa rahma, and a source of guidance and mercy. Allahumma dhakirna minhuma, Nasina or Nusina. Oh Allah, remind us of it what we have forgotten or what we were made to forget of it. And teach us from the Quran what we are ignorant of. And grant us the ability to recite it throughout the night and at times in the day. And make it a a proof for us on the day of judgment. Ya Rabbil Alameen, Ameen. Alhamdulillah, we're in the month of Ramadan now. And so I will ask everyone to make the most of the Quran, reciting the Quran and and, and making dua for us for the whole Ummah, inshaAllah. Just a quick note, last week, we were supposed to have lesson last week, but we didn't because unfortunately um, in our local area, 
our in our madrasa, our main Sheikh al Hadith, our teacher and spiritual guide, uh, Sheikh Adam Rahimahullah passed away last week, Thursday. And so from Thursday all the way to Sunday, it was a very hectic time. Sheikh Adam Rahimahullah was basically is instrumental, not instrumental. He was the main the main reason through Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that Leicester is what it is today, the city of Leicester. And the amount of masajid, madaris that we have in this city, and the amount of scholars we have, Allah Mubarak, Allah increase them. Uh, the reason we have these things was through his hard work and the other uh, early scholars. And so his passing was a great loss, uh, not just for the city of Leicester, but for all of UK and even the world, subhanAllah. And so, yeah, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to elevate his status in genital firdos. We ask Allah to continue um, the benefit to continue. Uh, we ask Allah to allow us to continue benefit from his hard work, inshallah, and to take it from the next, from this stage to the next, inshallah, and to work on it and to make it grow further. Jazakumullah khairan. Aqulu qawli hadha. Astaghfirullah hadhi wa lakum wa lisaidin muslimin. Astaghfirullah inna huwa ghafur rahim. Right, any questions, inshallah? I think we'll leave maybe about five or ten minutes for questions. Bismillah. Uh, okay, end of slideshow. <clears throat> uh, Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. I'm Masar. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullah. How are you, Masar? Are you okay? I'm good. I'm good. How are you? Alhamdulillah. Allah's fadl. I'm well. Good, mashallah. Uh, uh, Sheikh, uh, in the in the early section of this uh, presentation, uh, yes, in the literature review, uh, you mentioned about Ajazul uh, uh, Quran by Imam uh, Baqil Lani. Yes, uh, and you talked about how he talks about you know various layers of the verses of the Quran, yeah, etc. So it immediately you know brings to mind uh, uh, this category of tafsir called you know tafsir ashari. Yes, and uh, and you know many many tafsirs then you know come to your mind like uh, Tadabbur yeah. Quran by uh, Sheikh Amin Islahi. Yes, and uh, recently I came across uh, this tafsir. I think it's called uh, uh, Tawilul Quran by Imam uh, Kashani. Okay, <laughs> so uh, they are very alluring if you read them. Uh, very metaphysical yeah. in nature. Yeah, but uh, my question is then: uh, What is the furqan? What is the criteria to know if if this uh, tafsir is uh, correct or not? If it's uh, based on ilham or uh, or if you know that can be a vasvasa yeah. or not? Because uh, yeah. right now you also mentioned in the section two of uh, Taki Usmani Sahab's uh, uh, book, uh, uh, it talks about the principles of uh, doing tafsir. So, yes. Yes. what 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 are these principles that they follow when they when they come uh, with something uh, of a tafsir ishari category? Right. So, Allah, so very good question. Uh, very important, and, and this goes back to what we mentioned about Subhanallah. The Quran and Sunnah are integral for us, right? And so, what you'll find is you're right. There are, you know, you have Tafsir Ishari and uh, Tafsir Baltini, and you know, people take all kinds of, uh, you know, interpretations out from the verses that can't even be justified. And subhanAllah, unfortunately, many of the Sufi or Tasawwuf uh, inclined scholars, not all of them, some of them, they tend to, they, they're most known for this. But again, it kind of tarnishes the image of Tasawwuf and, and, and what it's really about, right? And so one thing that um, um, the scholar, sorry, he's just left my Ibn al Qayyim al Jawziyah, rahimahullah. He mentions a couple of uh, principles and he basically says that any tafasir or ta ta'wil that you take out, there has to be, it, it has to abide by, he mentions about four or five principles. And some of them are, for example, I'll give you one of them is it cannot outwardly go against the Quran and Sunnah. 
right? If there's something that, subhanAllah, uh, a verse of the Qur'an mentions clearly or a hadith mentions clearly that this verse of the Qur'an is regarding this and then subhanAllah, a scholar comes along and says, I've did tafakkur and tadabbur and I've come to the conclusion it means this and it's completely going against what we find in the Quran and the Sunnah, and this would be a this would be a clear, a flagrant, um, uh, you know, going against the Quran and Sunnah, right? And so we wouldn't be able to take uh, that kind of tafsir or that kind of ta'wil. Um, we had, for example, there was a time I had to do some research on Shi'i tafsir and even uh, Sufi tafsir. So there was a verse, uh, Shi'i Tafsir, subhanAllah, they mentioned uh, in Imam Qummi, I think it was, if I'm not mistaken, Imam Qummi's book. And he says, Dhalika al-kitabu la rayba fi, Dhalika al-kitab. And again, if we look at Dhalika al-kitab and what the context tells us, it's referring to the Qur'an. But Imam Qummi says that Dhalika al-kitab, he says, uh, Ay Ali, radiallahu an. Right now, this is a clear example of it's gone against the Quran and Sunnah, and it's just kind of following uh, some of these, uh, you know, ideological ideas that certain groups have. So there are a number of conditions. Uh, another condition is the verse. There needs to be some indication of that meaning in the verse. I'll give you an example of this. Uh, uh, for example, uh, in the verse of the Quran, uh, sabila, regarding Hajj. So Allah says, Hajj is necessary. Sabila, for those who are able to manage a way to it. Now, sabila, if you look in the hadith, there's a uh, explanation that the Prophet وسلم, gives, and he says, Azad wa Rahila, which basically means conveyance and provisions. If you have conveyance and you have provisions, then that's enough. However, there's a scholar, Imam Tusturi, if I'm not mistaken. He says, Manistata'ilayhi sabila means a dhikr wa sabr, dhikrullah and sabr. Now, that could be chalked up to be, oh man, subhanAllah, it's just one of these Sufi tafsirs, right? Just, you know, just ignoring um, the, the hadith and going and giving another tafsir. But what's interesting about his tafsir is number one, he does not say the hadith is wrong. So he says the hadith is there, but this is extra. And another point that he mentions is if you look at the verses of Hajj, they all talk about a couple of things. They talk about dhikr, right? Fadkurullaha inda al mash'ar al haram. It mentions dhikr again and again and again. And he also talks about sabr, la jidala, you know, la ula fusuqa la jidala fil hajj. And so the way he derived that tafsir was based on other verses of Hajj. And so this is a clear example of a tafsir that someone has uh, suggested, but it's rooted and it's connected to the verses. And there's some indication in the verse that this could be justified. When there isn't any kind of justification, for example, Dhalik al-Kitab Ay Ali, when there isn't any justification, in situations like that, um, you cannot take it at all. Well, inshallah, when we talk about sources of tafsir, we're going to look at this further in, in much more detail, inshallah, brother Mazhar. So I hope that um, sheds some light on or, or answers some of your question. Yes, uh, may, maybe something in detail uh, would, would satisfy me more. Uh, the, thing is, the thing is that... Uh, if you, uh, you know, this is something which I have always thought that if, you know, in Surah Hadith, Allah calls himself Az-Zahir and then he also calls himself Al-Batin. Yes. And if he calls himself Az-Zahir, then I think that there's going to be uh, knowledge uh, which leads to, you know, this attribute of, you know, defining the attribute of Allah being Az-Zahir. And yeah. if he say, calls himself Al-Batin, then there has to be something uh, which uh, defines the attribute of Allah being Al-Batin. Now, if, no if, if we make the criteria to understand uh, Batini meanings, uh, if, if those criteria are uh, Zahir, you know, you have to yeah. find truths uh, yeah. through the Quran, Bil Quran, or through Quran, yeah. Bil Hadith, and if, and if they are, you know, too literal, yeah. then uh, aren't uh, the, the criteria then wrong into understanding uh, the deeper, uh, mysterious meanings maybe of the Quran? 
it's important that we take this into consideration that we are not denying that there are batini ma'ani of the Qur'an, without a doubt. No one can claim such a thing. SubhanAllah, many of the meanings of the Qur'an people haven't even discovered yet. So no one can claim that. And if anyone does claim that, they would be wrong in claiming that. However, we cannot just um, uh, leave the the rules and regulations of the Sharia aside. There's a, there's a famous discussion, even in uh, Mufti Taqi's book, he mentions that um you know things like kashf and ilham and things like that we many of the scholars believe that those things uh, you know mukashafa that they take place however and this is very important they cannot have the same level as established wahi right so you're absolutely right those things are there they they're possible subhanallah however there is no way uh, reason being is because the Qur'an and the established rules that the Qur'an parameters has set and from the hadith is is wahi. We're going to read in next week's lesson, inshallah, that um, that there are two types of wahi. You have uh, wahi matlu, which is recited wahi, and what wahi ghair matlu, which is the hadith. Now, the knowledge that comes from there is revelation. What we are trying to do and anyone else after the Prophet وسلم, it's going to be speculation at best. That's what it is. And you can take it provided that you have some conditions in place. Um, and also you cannot give it a, an importance or a, a, a level higher than it warrants. I hope that makes sense, inshallah. Yes, uh, definitely. Sheikh. Okay. Alhamdulillah. Barakallahu feekum. Okay, someone, uh, Abir Mia asked, was not Abdullah bin Mas'ud a better mufassir than Abdullah bin Abbas? Okay, subhanAllah, mashallah. Right, so sometimes you get into the, these discussions between uh, different madhahib in, in, in fiqh. Abdullah bin Mas'ud was uh, much older during the time of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, an experienced reciter. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, used to tell him to recite to him. He was very experienced, much more experienced. However, uh, Abdullah ibn Abbas is, is quoted again and again for a number of reasons. Number one, the specific dua that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, made for him. And so, the, you know, these are things that, subhanAllah, as Muslims, we cannot just gloss over and say, you know, oh, it was just a supplication. SubhanAllah, supplications mean everything to us, even if it's, uh, especially if it's authentically established from the Prophet SallAllahu Alaihi Wasallam. The Prophet SallAllahu Alaihi Wasallam said regarding him, Allahumma faqihu fi deen wa allimhu ta'wil. Oh Allah, give him deep understanding of the deen and give him and teach him how to do ta'wil. And so ta'wil is connected with the Qur'an, right? And another thing about Abdullah ibn Abbas is that subhanAllah, when he, when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam passed away, he started his journey of knowledge and he would go to all of the Sahaba. And it's not unlikely that he would have gone to Abdullah ibn Mas'ud too. Right, and he would have gone to him. So, what we find from Abdullah ibn Abbas is it's he's got the knowledge which is an amalgamation of all of the knowledge from majority of the Sahaba. So, Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, of course, subhanAllah, in seniority, in, in, in understanding, and without a doubt, no one can question that. But Abdullah ibn Abbas does have a special. A, a special rank in tafsir and when they're quoting uh, mufassirun they will probably from the time of the sahaba they will probably always quote abdullah ibn abbas first i hope that makes sense wa antum jazakumullah khairan right uh, i need to see, how do we get are there any messages here chat no, there isn't. Okay, that's fine. Any on the... Yeah, any other questions? Or should we call it a day, inshallah? SubhanAllah, we're ever so close to iftar time here as well in the UK. So, mashallah, those of you who are here, Allah reward you. <clears throat> okay. 
Sheikh Mohammed Salman, I think we call it a day, inshallah. What do you think? Yeah, Sheikh. Yeah, okay. Alhamdulillah. Jazakallah khair, everyone. Uh, remember me in your du'as. Uh, Allah accept your ibadat and your siyam and your qiyam. Uh, Jazakallah khair. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.